Hey, welcome back. So we got a, I got an interesting question here. So here's two molecules. So CH3OH and CH3F. And the question is, what can you tell me about the boiling points and or the intermolecular forces between? How would you predict the boiling point of the first one to be compared to the second one? And of course, this is really a question all about intermolecular forces. So the question is, what do you have? And in terms of intermolecular forces, well, we know that each one has London. And the London forces scale as the number of electrons. So we would say that the CH3F, right, is a little bit heavier than this guy here. So it probably has a slightly stronger London force. It's probably got a few more electrons, maybe. Um, so we might expect this one to have the strongest intermolecular force. So that would mean, presumably, it would have the largest pointing point. And uh, then, well, if that were the case, right, we've done. Right, we've answered the question. And it turns out that the boiling point is quite different, actually. The boiling point of this one here is minus 78 degrees C, and this one here is um, 65 degrees C. So we can say, oh, rats, we must have got it wrong, right? So the CH3OH boils at a much higher temperature. It's going to have much stronger intermolecular forces. So uh, we are really far off, too. So uh, you might say, well, okay, what else do we have? And the thing is, we got to go to the structures. So CH3OH, um, if you draw this structure out, oops, looks something like so. And if you look at CH3F, okay, the Lewis structure looks something uh, like so. And I've got to put my lone pairs in there. Sorry about that. Um, remember, uh, we looked at dipole-dipole intermolecular forces. So we got to look at the individual bonds. So we know that oxygen is more polar than carbon and it's a lot more polar than hydrogen so we've got bond dipoles that look something like that what about the ch's well they're so wimpy we can ignore them uh look at the cf there right that's an incredibly polar bond right so it's going to have a, a very uh, long dipole moment there um now for the first molecule we've got two dipole moments we got one pointing this way and we got one pointing this way so overall dipole moment right we have to sum them together so the overall dipole looks something like that Okay, now maybe I've drawn a little bit too long. Um, so you might say, well, they both then have dipole-dipole intermolecular forces. And so at this point here, right, we're looking like a tie. And uh, we know that we've missed something like crazy because this one's boiling point, right, is way, way, way higher than this one here. So, uh, of course, the crazy thing we've missed, right, is the hydrogen bond uh, because this one can hydrogen bond. And so we looked at it in the last video, right, this has the ability to uh, form that very, very strong intermolecular force called the hydrogen bond. And it can do so by arranging itself so that the hydrogen uh, attached to the very electronegative oxygen can hydrogen bond to a lone pair on a very electronegative oxygen. So those are the two conditions we need for a hydrogen bond. Now, you might say, well, what about this hydrogen over here? Can it hydrogen bond? And the answer is no. It's got to be bonded to one of those three electronegative elements, oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine. You might say, well, can this hydrogen bond too? It's got a lone pair on a fluorine, so that counts, right? And it's got a hydrogen on a carbon, which doesn't count. So it turns out that it has half of what it needs. So this is what we call a hydrogen bond acceptor, right? It's got a lone pair on an electronegative atom, but it does not have a hydrogen bond donor. And so this has both an acceptor and a donor, and so they can come together and they can stick together. So that kind of explains that mystery.